Welcome to another edition of the Marcus Freeman Show presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, joined as always by the head coach, Marcus Freeman. Coach, I know it did not go the way you guys wanted to this past Saturday. In your post-game presser, you said you had to evaluate everything. So I'm curious, a couple days removed, what have been your biggest takeaways and what's your assessment since the game? Well, it comes down to a, a lack of execution. Sometimes you get so um, blogged down with the end result and winning and, and finishing games that you really lose sight of really what it takes to, to do that. And it's not just about finishing with us. Our, it's, it's been our lack of execution. So um, we have to coach better. We have to play better. We got to practice better. Um, and then ultimately go perform better on uh, Saturdays. As the head coach, let me ask you then, because I've heard you talk about execution a lot in the post-game press or in your weekly press conference. How do you, as the head coach, ensure that that execution goes up a level across the board? I think it goes back to your preparation. I think it goes back to really the practice habits and, hey, are we executing exactly what we want to do, no matter what the result of the play is, mm -hmm. good or bad, right? And, and then, you know, somebody else, the, 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 it might be offense and we complete a ball, but, hey, is the right tackle doing exactly what we want him to do or is the backside wide receiver um, doing exactly the, the, the requirements of his position? And so we have to look at um, everything from a very individualized point of view uh, and make sure we're executing no matter what the end result is. Coach, appreciate it. We'll step aside and come back to recap Notre Dame's game against Marshall after this on this week's edition of the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireRack.com. It's now time to go inside the game between Notre Dame and Marshall. Coach, I still want to ask you first before we get into the contest. First time taking the team out of the tunnel. What did it feel like to be the head coach running them out of the tunnel for the first time? It was surreal, just like I thought it would be. What an amazing experience, adrenaline rush, and one that you'll never forget. Offense started a little slow. One guy I wanted to talk about was Jaden Thomas. Made a big catch for you on third and eight. He's an exciting young player. Just when you watch him, what excites you most about his future with this team? Yeah, I think you talk about a guy that's going to continue to get better. He redshirted last year. Um, I think he had around 30 snaps versus Ohio State and had probably 50 this week. And he's a guy that has, is a really good route runner, big body, that will, will be a, a threat for us on the offensive side of the ball. But we have to continue to keep getting him reps in the game and, and you know, get him that experience that it takes to, to play at a high level. I want to talk about an early first quarter drive. You guys drove the ball down, had a fourth and four at about the 31 yard line. These are those decisions now as head coach, you have to always be doing the math. Did you consider the field goal from 48 yards? And then on that fourth and four, what did you see on that play where you guys were un unable to pick up the yardage? Well, yeah, I was in communication with our special teams coordinator. We were going against the win and uh, in warm ups, that was probably right there at the edge of, of where he was making it. So there wasn't a, um, a huge amount of confidence just from making a 49 yard field goal into the wind. Um, was something that we wanted to do. So we decided to go for it. And, uh, you know, Tyler, I, I, as you go back and watch it, he, he, he took a peek to the three-man side, and, and that's probably where we wanted to go. Um, and then he came off of it and went to, you know, Braden Lindsay on the one-on-one. -on -one and, and, you know, braden has got to try to stay in bounds there, and we got to give him a ball that keeps him in bounds. And so, um, again, one of those plays that we're going to be aggressive. You know, we don't want to be cautious and, uh, you know, we have to find a way to convert on fourth and four. Drive a little bit later, you had a nice chunk play to pick up some yards from Lorenzo Styles. Just that was a cool play we're gonna get a chance to look at later in Irish Intel. What'd you like on that play that you saw from the offense to pick up some of those more chunk plays? Yeah, it was end up being a reverse. It was really based off a play we did the week before where Tyler kept the ball and, and um, it kind of happened just how we wanted. If we end up, you know, maybe sustaining a block, uh, I think by Braden a little bit longer, that thing might still be running. And so um, that was a huge play for us. We wanted to find a way to get some big plays, be creative, and uh, that was an example of that. The interception, unfortunately, comes a couple throws later. Just on that play, what did you see, and what have you guys been coaching to try to eliminate plays like that? Yeah, we were, the guy was in off coverage, but playing man and, and the corner jumped it. And, you know, we would probably say Tyler was just a little bit late with his decision to go to Braden on that play. And Braden's got to run the route a little bit more precise and maybe a little bit more speed coming off the ball. And so those are the little things that we talk about in terms of execution that matter. And, and not just looking at the result of it being an interception, but okay. Tyler, your read should have been a little bit quicker. Braden, your route, can we, we make sure it's a little bit more precise and then we'll get the result that we want. Marshall managed to score a touchdown and missed the extra point. So it's six nothing at this point. Your offense came back, I thought, with a really nice drive. Five plays, 56 yards. What about that drive is the kind of stuff you guys can replicate and do more of going forward? Yeah, I think during that drive, you see um, Tyler making a couple plays with his feet. Um, I think the Marshall jumped off sides. You get a five yard penalty and, and then Mike Mayer, does things that Michael Mayer does, and, and uh, 
he gets the ball down to the one yard line and Tyler's able to run it in. But I think it was the ability to use some tempo, the ability to have no negative yardage plays there and, and, and stay you know, on rhythm and on track that, that we want to do and uh, to put the ball in the end zone when it matters most. You guys took the lead there and then Marshall, really long drive, 12 plays, 74 yards. They were able to tack on some points before halftime. I know defensive side of the ball is important to you having come from the coordinator position. What about that drive? Where can you guys find the opportunities to get off the field a little bit sooner and, present, and prevent those longer sustained drives? Yeah, I think back to that drive, and I don't know if we had one third down mm -hmm. um, on that drive. They had a couple big plays where um, we were in man coverage. Um, they end up cracking our guy that's in man coverage that goes for 11, 12 yards, and um, they end up throwing a, uh, a, an out route, I think, versus uh, a zone coverage for another 11, 8 yards. And, then we had a 15-yard face mask penalty that ultimately kept the drive going. But what we have to do is get them into a third down situation, hopefully third and long, which makes it uh, a little bit more difficult to continue to move the ball forward. You guys are down 9-7. We had a chance there, I think with 11 seconds left or so, to hit Braden Lindsey over the top. He had a couple steps and the ball maybe just slightly overthrown. When you go back and watch that, what's the communication now with the offense? Because it seemed like you executed to get your guy open for a chance to score, but the ball is just a little bit too far out there. As the head coach, how do you evaluate a play like that? Well, it was a, it, to me, it was more of a statement play where there's 15 or 12 seconds left on in, in be, before the half. And some teams you'll see just taking me and I said, no, we want to be aggressive. No matter what happens on this play, we want our guys to understand there's a belief that we're going to be aggressive. We're not going to stop until, you know, they say the end of the half or the end of the game. And so that was one of those plays we wanted to take a shot and it came open and we missed it by a yard. But, you know, those are the plays we got to execute. Those are the situations that if we execute there, that's a touchdown or a big play and we try to kick a field goal. What was the message in the locker room at halftime? What adjustments did you guys try to make as you got set for the second half? My message to them was we got to start fast in the third quarter. We got to come out the locker room in the first four minutes, make sure we start fast, and then we got to win the fourth. And ultimately, we end up having two turnovers in the, the second half of the game. Um, there was another big long drive that, that we didn't get them off the field and ultimately led to a defeat. But, you know, it's the ability to go back now and, and execute, right? Look at it and say, okay, where was the lack of execution in the second half that we have to make sure that we improve that? You did have one good drive there in the second half, a sustained drive that led to that touchdown you had, similar to what we talked about earlier. Just the things you saw on that drive, what are you trying to do more of that to translate going forward into this next week against Cal? You know, I think it's the ability to just try to take advantage of, of what you're seeing defensively. You know, make good decisions. You know, we try to vary our tempo and then ultimately get the ball into the hands of the guys that make plays. You know, another big catch by Michael Mayer. You know, when we're rolling out, we throw the ball to Kevin Bowman and, and, and he makes a big play and gets the ball down there and then we score. Um, you know, as the first play in the fourth quarter. So again, it's ability to stay on track, you know, not have negative yardage plays, but also get the ball into the hands of those guys that can make plays. I want to ask you about defense, just because we're two weeks into the year and you don't have a takeaway yet. I know this is a defense that has a ton of skill on that side. I think everyone assumed you'd have a couple takeaways by now. When you've watched the film, what are you seeing and where can you guys make the changes to start generating some more turnovers on the defensive side of the ball? You know, I think it's it goes back to we got to emphasize it more in practice, right? It has to be something at the forefront of their minds when they have a chance to get the ball out, when they see the ball, that they're knocking it out. And, and it's a, a relentless pursuit from, from guys retracing, trying to get to the ball carrier to be in a position to get that ball out. And, and you know, the ones that where you can force the ball out and truly, uh, you know, uh, create a, a takeaway by by creating a forced fumble, those are the ones that we got to improve that. I want to ask about what it's like after a game like this in the locker room. I'm sure it's not a lot of happy faces, but there's still a lot of season left. So how important is your role as the head coach and how important is the leadership on this team to still look at the next 10 games and see there's a lot of opportunity in front of us? Yeah, I think that it, it you can't look at it even in that realm of, of 10 games. You got to look at it and say, OK, hey, where, where are we at right now? And, and it's not easy to you know, have that conversation uh, with, with this team who's not used to losing. You know, as I told them, this is where we'll need our leadership the most right now. From your head coach, from your coaches, from your leaders on your team, we'll need your leadership now more than ever because that's to me defines the culture of your program is when things are tough, right? And when things aren't going as well, you know, let's, let's see who we really are deep down. And so we'll need leadership starting from me to every coach, to every leader that we have on our team to make sure we look at, take a deep dive and look at our Ourselves, right, and how we can improve as individuals, and and that gives us a chance to win those games. We're, let's not worry so much about the result of the games, the next ten games, as much as, okay, what do we have to do 
to earn that result that we want. Coach, appreciate it. We'll step aside and come back with more on this week's edition of the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by TireAct.com. So, J.D., I know you guys didn't get the result you wanted this past weekend. Now that it's been a couple of days, just what's the team's focus been? How you guys have been trying to bounce back as you get ready for Cal? It's not necessarily just starters, but it's special teams. It's scout team. It goes all levels from the top to the bottom. And so just going from there and making sure that every single person is doing their job. I want to go off the field a little bit with you now and take a step back to when you decided to come to Notre Dame. I know this is a place that's special to you, but when you reflect on your time here, just what's the impact been that Notre Dame has had on you? It's one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life, just because I think it's such a holistic experience. Like it's not just the football side, it's not just the school side, it's the community side. It's that I have so many friends that I met in Duncan Hall that I'm still friends with today and I go hang out with. And even through the ups, the downs, I mean, the wins, the losses, like they're there for me and they're there for me, even if it's not talking football, it's just talking life. And so just being able to have that holistic approach to a school is very unique nowadays, especially being a student athlete. One of the interesting things I think in the summer was the fact that you got to go to Omaha and watch the baseball team who had that awesome run. Your brother, of course, highly featured in that. He's a pitcher for the team. Just to get a chance to watch him perform on that stage and, and make the trip out there. Tell me a little bit about how special that experience was for you and your family. Going to Omaha and I mean, it started even before that. Going to the Tennessee game was such a cool experience. Me. Isaiah Foskey, Alex Ehrensberger, Jack Kaiser, we all got in the car for the Tennessee game and drove the seven or eight hours and got there for like the sixth inning and stayed there. And I mean, it was just awesome. Just being able to see them take down the team that's supposed to be the best team in all of America and so long, like it's a cool experience. I know you've done a lot to give back to the local community here in South Bend. Just why have you done that? And what's so important about that to you? Giving back to the community just one of the, I mean, biggest things that I can do, especially just having a platform. I mean, even though it may not be the biggest platform, but just being able to make a smile on someone's day or being able to just impact them in any way is super important to me. And whether it's going with Coach Freeman and a couple of guys to the Ronald McDonald house and visiting, or even just this past Marshall game, we had an uplifting athlete's rare disease tailgate where we invited some community members from the local area to come to the game, have a tailgate. And so that we had a bunch of guys come out and introduce themselves to the rare disease patients, to their families. And I mean, take this moment to better themselves and just better this community. I was gonna follow up with that. Yeah, I know things have not gone the right way. You guys wanted the first two weeks in the football field, but yeah. you just pointed that out. Is that really important to have that perspective that even if you're not playing your best football, there's a lot more that's going on in life? Most definitely. And I think there's these people that are going through so much bigger struggles than winning or losing a football game. And I think there are just bigger things in life than just football. And so whether it is just being able to touch someone's heart or just be able to put a smile or just give them our gloves after the game and just being able to do those little acts of kindness that maybe might make their week, might make their day, might just make their hour, like it can make a difference. JD, appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Of course, thank you. So Chris, I know you guys didn't get the result you wanted this past weekend. Now that it's been a couple of days, just what's the team's mindset been like and what's the focus been as you guys get set to go into the next week? Yeah, our mindset going into this week is just you know, making sure everyone does their own job. Um, you know, there's 11 players on the field and everyone has to do their 111th. Um, so the biggest thing that Coach Freeman is, you know, pushed out to us just doing your job and executing whatever you have to do on the field. You know, if time moves fast in college athletics. I feel like it was just a couple of years ago when you were the new freshman. Now you're kind of one of the leaders in the running back room. So what's your role amongst the running backs to try to make the improvements you guys have to make going forward? Yeah, at this point of the season, I just have to make sure that, you know, everyone is being held accountable. Um, I understand, like, the standard and the examples that I have to set for the rest of the people in the room. So, you know, just having clear communication with the coaches and then, you know, just bringing whatever messages they have to the players is what I'm doing right now. What's something you guys can do on offense? You said 111th is, is a really interesting way to put it, but the whole offense when you come to 11 11s, what are you guys doing to try to generate maybe some more explosive plays on offense and put up some more points on the scoreboard? Yeah, the biggest thing for us is, you know, just making sure that the, the best players on the field get the ball as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that, you know, we all have clear trust, I mean, from the coaches to the players to even Coach Freeman. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just making sure that everyone does their job. And like I said before, you just have to do your 111. Something I know that's important to you and a lot of guys on the team is finding a way to give back to the local community. What have you done to do that during your time here at Notre Dame? Yeah, um, just recently I was at a food drive with some of my teammates. Um, we were 
packaging some um, meals for, you know, kids that, you know, don't really have that many meals when they get home. So, you know, just being able to, to affect the community in a different way, um, get your face out there and, and you know, getting out, out there in the community and helping in any way I can is something that I want to do. So, um, you know, any opportunity I get to help the community is um, something I'm, I'm going to take advantage of. When you do that, does it put in perspective football a little bit? I know things didn't go the way you guys wanted the last couple of weeks, but then when you go into the community and you're helping someone get food on the table that might not have that opportunity otherwise, does it help put the losses in perspective sometimes? Yeah, at the end of the day, you know, it's bigger than football. Um, I understand that I represent a really great university and, and, and a really great team. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that came before me and a lot of great people that will come after. So, Last thing, let's go back to football a little bit. There's still 10 games left. There's a lot of time for you guys. What's the focus and what's success going to look like for this team this year? Um, for one, I would say it's just going to be us letting loose, having fun. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said before, you have to do your job. You have to do your 111th. So um, I would say it's going to be based on discipline and um, you know just letting loose. I mean, we've been playing this game for a really long time and we're obviously really good at it. That's why we're here. So you know, just letting loose and doing what we do. Awesome, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thank you. No problem. It's now time for this week's edition of Irish Intel, where we go inside the play. Coach, we talked about a little bit earlier. First play of the game, hard to imagine it going much better. You're going to see a corner blitz here. Tyler Buckner diagnoses it, and he hits Lorenzo Styles for a huge first play of the game. Yeah, this is a, a huge way to, to start off your season. And again, you see the corner blitz in here. You know, we don't get a piece of 44 um, like we wanted to, but Tyler stands in there, throws a great ball to Lorenzo Styles, and, you know, he's able to keep the ball security and, and you know, that's a big play. You know, it makes a guy a safety miss, and that's a huge starter for our offense. Is this the kind of thing where Tyler, if he sees that corner come down, he knows he's hot and he's yep. just going to go to Lorenzo right away? Yep, if you're able to read it, yep, get the ball out. It's an automatic check. All right, Coach, so here you got third and two. We talked about it a little bit earlier as well. You have the option to maybe go for it on fourth and two. What's the discussion like as you guys decide to call this play and then ultimately take the shot down the field? Well, you, you see it's the first play of the second quarter, and so now you're on a TV timeout. You're able to discuss this over the headset, and Coach Reese felt strongly about, hey, if they, they were going to stack the box and we get one-on-one -on -one with Matt Salerno here, we're going to take a shot. And, and again, that's a credit to Matt and the confidence he's built in our coaching staff and our team, and, and what you see is a great execution of of what we want to do here and a great job of catching the ball here, staying focused on the ball and uh, making a huge play for our offense that leads to, a, leads to a score. What kind of concentration does it take to make the play? You get a great look in slow-mo <laughs> here, but look, I mean, this thing is all over the place and he manages to bring it in. Yeah, I don't know if he wanted to have his mouth open like that, but um, <laughs> the ability for him to, again, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. And the uh, ability for him to just continue to focus on that ball and bring it in, again, is, is a credit to Matt and uh, Coach Stuck in the work they put in. So coach, this last play here, I think it really illustrates the dynamic nature of Tyler Buckner. You're gonna have him in the shotgun here. He's got a couple of options. Just talk me through how this play comes together and ultimately leads to the big pickup by Tyler. Yeah, well, as you look at this, it's really like you're reading the defensive end. So you have two blockers. One is gonna be for the first guy that shows up, the, the corner in this picture, and then the second blocker is gonna loop around for the first linebacker that shows. We'll read the defensive end, and it's a great job of executing. We almost get a, a piece of that linebacker, but you know he's able to actually make the tackle. But if we get a bigger piece of that linebacker, Backer, this team might still be running because Tyler Buckner's speed can go. This is the kind of stuff that in year two, are you seeing him pick up even more of the offense and now he's starting to diagnose things on his own that he can have more wrinkles added to the playbook? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and it's a, the ability for him and Coach Reese to be on the same page in terms of what they're able to do, what they're looking for. And again, this is just a great job of executing. It's more than just Tyler, but mm -hmm. you know, with Mayer to be able to kick that guy at the corner out, he can read the end. It's a pull read. He pulls the ball and we almost take it for a, a huge game. Welcome back to the Marcus Freeman Show, presented by the experts at TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's Look Ahead, where we highlight Notre Dame's upcoming opponent. It's now time for this week's Look Ahead segment. We're joined, as always, by Bill Reese. Bill, appreciate you taking the time. I know it was a frustrating weekend, obviously, for the whole football team, not the result anybody wanted against Marshall. Uh, just in general, though, the last couple of days, how's the team tried to bounce back and respond and kind of turn the page and start moving towards Cal? You know, we uh, got right back out on the field on Sunday night, uh, you know, got uh, some of the aches and pains worked out, get guys loosened up. Um, you know, they were eager to get back out on the field, get practicing, looking forward to playing Cal this weekend and, you know, put the uh, put the game behind us. 
Big news this week, of course, is that Tyler Buckner, unfortunately, suffered that injury that's going to keep him out really the rest of the regular season. Uh, I'm sure everybody around there is disappointed and, and hurt for him because he won't get a chance to to compete. But now it's next man up. And Drew Pine, obviously Notre Dame fans, saw him last year at Wisconsin, also came in a little bit in that Cincinnati game, of course, was huge in the Wisconsin game. Now that he's going to be the starter What's kind of the mindset around the building and, and what can fans expect from Drew as he now gets a chance to start a game? Well, you know, first of all, we are really disappointed uh, that um, Tyler got hurt. And, you know, it was his second start, uh, was really beginning to grow and, and feel uh, more comfortable and, and being the leader of the offense. Um, he did, you know, some really good things in the first two games and he just needed more and more reps to build on it. So I know you know, he's, he's um, disappointed. He's frustrated. Um, You know, we all are because we see so much ability in him, but with that uh, injuries are part of football and they're going to happen. And, you know, there's a really strong tradition here of next man in uh, with Notre Dame football. And and Drew Pine has been a tremendous teammate. Uh, He has responded when it's been his opportunities in the past and uh, he'll he'll do more of the same. He's going to have Obviously, you know, more opportunities to play and and be the starter. And, you know, quite honestly, I I would expect him to do very well. The other name that Notre Dame fans maybe got a little bit accustomed to during the spring was Steve Angeli. He, of course, uh, was featured heavily in that second half of the spring game, actually led the game winning drive in the spring game where he leapt into the end zone for a touchdown as as time ran out. He's obviously a little bit younger, less experienced, but now he finds himself in the role that Drew was in just a week ago. He's the backup, and, and as it was alluded to today during the press conference, he might be one snap away. So what's the focus, I guess, for the staff and for the team to make sure that Steve is now prepared in a way to possibly take snaps if his name is called? Well, you know, Steve has benefited from being here since last spring. He was an early enrollee. And, um, you know, the staff really enjoys, um, you know, getting around kids or families. We got to know, you know, Steve's family uh, last spring, and he just felt more and more comfortable with being at Notre Dame. So that's really benefited him um, as he's progressed. He had a very good summer. Um, He throws a very good ball. He has good height, good feel in the pocket. He's been down running the scout team, which, you know, isn't running our offense, but he did get, you know, enough reps during uh, camp to at least show us, hey, this guy's really going to be a good player. So, um, you know, he's he's going to be up with the varsity now. He's the number two quarterback and he's going to prepare like crazy. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to, you know, accelerating his development. So, um, you know, it's probably coming obviously a year early than we probably would have thought, but um, he's going to be up to it. And like I said, he's benefited from being here uh, since last January. One guy I want to highlight before we start looking at Cal is Michael Mayer. It's his third year on campus. I think the second that he put a jersey on and played as a freshman during the COVID year, everyone knew he was a special player. Obviously, you know, the, the loss was something that was disappointing, but his performance was not. He was over 100 yards. Seems like he's living up to the billing of being the best tight end in the country. What I found interesting was he even caught a a ball down the sideline. We were used to seeing him go over the middle and we're seeing him in in run blocking, but it just seems like he continues to add tools to his toolbox. You get to see him up close. The whole staff does just how special is he and how fun is it to watch Michael Mayer continue to develop at this level? You know, it's really pretty simple. When you evaluate a tight end, there are three things you look for. Can he run? Can he catch? And can he block? Well, you know, since day one, Mike has been able to do that. And if you can do all three, you're going to be a high draft choice or you're going to be in the Pro Bowl or you're going to be an All-American. And, uh, you know, he checks all the boxes. Um, You know, watching him at practice, uh, his work ethic, his attention to detail has been very good from the day he's been here. And, you know, he's he's obviously, you know, a key player uh, component of what we're trying to do on offense. He's really one of the guy, you know, really one guy that, you know, can get the quarterback off the hook. You know, if it's third down, if it's, you know, we need a big play, you know, Michael's right now, the, the one guy that can really get us off the hook. 
One thing I want to look at is the running game. I think the running game is an area that this team can really take that next step. As you guys prepared for Cal this week, where's the focus to kind of unlock that running room? Because there are so many talented and skilled running backs that seem poised to really have some big games going forward. Well, it's like any running game. It starts up front, but you're, you know, you're going to have to have contributions from the tight ends and, and they're blocking. You're going to have to have contributions from the wide receivers when the ball gets outside and have them block. We got to make sure that we're pointing out the right um, call uh, so we can get the angles properly uh, blocked. So, um, you know, it's still a work in progress in terms of just some of the players. Um, you know, we didn't have Jarrett against Ohio State. We had him this week. Um, you know, uh, it's maybe the fourth or fifth start for um, uh, Zeke at center. Um, the two tackles people you know, got to remember they're true sophomores and, uh, uh, you know, Blake has, you know, started four games. So, you know, he's learning how to play 60, 70, 80 plays a game. And that doesn't happen, you know, overnight. So we're continuing to grow. Um, it's a good group. Um, they've got the best, uh, line coach in the country and Harry, he said, you know, it, it's going to come around. It takes a while, uh, you know, for a running game really to to take hold in, in a lot of instances. Last thing before we move ahead to Cal is defensive side of the ball. Defense, I thought, acquitted themselves nicely in Ohio State. Again, the points allowed have not been very high, so it's been good, but they haven't yet created a turnover, and that was something they did really well a lot of last year. A lot of the same players are back on defense, too. Is there any talk about how to maybe generate a few more takeaways going forward? Well, I, I can tell you from day one, that has been an emphasis. And they um, work on it every day at practice. They talk about it in meetings. It's a huge point of emphasis for uh, Coach Golden and the staff. Uh, each staff member will take a part of, uh, you know, how to uh, disrupt the ball, how to dislodge it, Um all those types of things. And it's, and it's emphasized and, you know, it's like anything else. Uh, they kind of come in spurts and we've gotten, you know, we haven't gotten one yet, but uh, you know, I'm anticipating we're going to start to get some here and, and get a lot of them. All right, let's turn our attention towards Cal. They come to Notre Dame and frankly haven't played against the Irish in a long time. It's a, it's a team that Notre Dame is not as familiar with. Uh, you look at what they present on both sides of the ball. We'll get to that in a second. But Justin Wilcox, uh, you know, sixth season with that program. They just extended him just as far as a program coming in. What does Cal represent when they come to Notre Dame this weekend? Well, you know, they're, uh, you know, a team that has good personnel. And you can re recruit the state of California as the University of California. And there are going to be a lot of good players uh, right in your own backyard, right down in Southern California, and they do a good job of identifying good players uh, in the state of California. So they're going to have speed. They have good size. Uh, they're well coached on both sides of the ball. As you mentioned, uh, Coach Wilcox, he's a defensive coach uh, by trade. And, you know, he, he you can see his fingerprints on their defense. They're very well coached. And on offense, Bill Musgrave is the offensive coordinator who's Coached in the NFL a long time. He um, played at Oregon. Um, you know, very cerebral guy, an excellent football coach. Offensively, it's kind of a unique wrinkle. We see it now more and more, I guess, with the transfer portal. But Jack Plummer is their quarterback, who Notre Dame fans saw last year when Purdue game here came here. Obviously, really entertaining game when Purdue was here. So they'll have some film on last year's performance. But from his standpoint, what challenges does he present to the Notre Dame defense this weekend? Well, he, he knows where to dress. So um, <laughs> he comes here, he'll, he'll be familiar with the locker room. But to be honest, uh, really, uh, Plummer and O'Connell a year ago, they were very, very similar. And um, uh, Jack has completed, I think, close to 70% of his passes throughout his career. Um, you know, he's very accurate. Um, he's a pocket passer. He's learning a little bit of a new offense. But you can see him getting more and more comfortable each week. Um, but he, you know, he's been a good addition for them. And, and he's kind of hit the ground running as being their starter. As far as weapons, you know, I see Jeremiah Hunter leads them in receiving. Uh, but just when you look at what they present offensively, other than Jack, who are some of the guys that might pop that, that the Irish have to be worried about when they get set to take them on? Well, Hunter's one of them. He, he is certainly a talented receiver. He had, I think, over 30 catches a year ago. Um, he's had, gotten off to a really good start this year. He's got 
good size, very aggressive going for the ball, good route runner. Um, but they have three uh, talented running backs. One is a true freshman. Uh, so they want to be balanced. They want to be able to run the ball, play action pass, take some shots down the field. Um, you know, very, very balanced, and uh, but multiple. They're going to want to do a lot of shifting and motions and things that our offense does. So our, our defense will be familiar with, you know, those types of uh, shifts and motions. When you look at the other side of the football uh, defensively, just schematically, what do they present? What kind of wrinkles may they show up with uh, that the Irish offense will have to be wary of going into the game? Well, you know, they base out of a 3-4, but in this day and age, a lot of teams are going to nickel and, and they play, a, you know, a large percentage of nickel uh, defense. But they have good edge rushers. They have two really good inside linebackers. One of uh, their inside linebackers is Jack Sermon, who uh, is a grad transfer. His dad is the defensive coordinator at Cal, and he led the University of Washington in tackles a year ago. So that was a, a good pickup for them because – not only is he productive, he's smart, gets people lined up. And then in the back end, they have a, a safety by the name of Daniel Scott, who's in his sixth year, uh, but he quarterbacks the uh, the back end of the defense. Very smart, um, very athletic, um, you know, will be a guy I'm sure that will be involved in a lot of different coverages for them on Saturday. Bill, as always, we appreciate the time. Looking forward to another game at Notre Dame Stadium when the Irish take on the Cal Bears. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Tony. We now present the highlights from a recent Coach Freeman press conference. Hey, Marcus, it's been floating out there that you have officially joined the Catholic Church. And I was just wondering if you could share with us when that happened, what it was like being confirmed, and just how important it's been to you since that occurred. Yeah, it was a, uh, a personal, I tried to keep it as private as I can, uh, private as I could, uh, family decision. and personal decision. Um, obviously, when you're head coach at Notre Dame, nothing's private. But yeah, just a decision I made and uh, um, was confirmed. Uh, shoot, I, I wish I could tell you today. It was September, in September. Next question will come from Tim Priester. Coach, I think um, we were a little surprised that uh, we, we um, got to speak with both coordinators this week and found out that we would have an opportunity to do that every week. Why did you, uh, why did you feel that that was important to do? I'm trying to give you guys as as much access as uh, you guys would want, and I know I can never give you as much as you you really need um, and would hope for, but I'm trying to give you a little bit more access. And, and again, I think it's. It's great for our coordinators to to get an opportunity to speak and to um, you know be able to to talk about the different things and um, that's going on in our program on their sides of, of the ball and so it was just something that I had been thinking about um, and uh, decided after last week to go ahead and give them an opportunity to meet with the media. Next question will be from Mike Berardino. Uh, hey, Marcus. Um, Manti Teo coming back is big news. Um, what do you make of that? Do you think you'll have a chance to put him in front of your team before the game itself? Uh, and just uh, how pleased are you that that is occurring? Oh, anytime you can have one of your greats come back, it is a uh, a great thing for our program. And, and I try to do that often is, is, um, is if we're going to have a, uh, a former great um, football player, but somebody that can just talk to our players as as one that has gone through it. Um, I, I love that opportunity. And so when I found out he would be coming back, um, you know, I, I think this is a great opportunity for um, for him to come back to Notre Dame, but for us to also, as a football program, uh, to, to utilize one of our own being back on campus. And so um, I hope that it depends on what time his flight gets in, but would love for him to be able to say hello to the team. And um, listen, I'm not looking for a big speech, but as an opportunity for our guys who know who Manti Teo is to be able to uh, be able to sit down and meet him and get a chance to meet one of our own. Next question will come from Eric Hansen. Hi, Marcus. I know it was referenced uh, Saturday that uh, Jared Patterson boiled over a little bit with some frustration, but he's been such a great leader for you. I'm wondering what his week in practice was like, how much pain is his foot? Is he still kind of playing through and, and just kind of what you saw of him from a leadership standpoint? 
Oh, he's been great. Um, he's had a great week of practice. Um, I don't know if I could sit here and and um, say that he feels 100%. You know, I think this will be something over time that he'll feel better and better as time goes on. But he's a warrior, and, and uh, you know, he really, really competed his tail off um, last week and had a great week of practice. He's been a great leader for our group, um, and uh, I expect him to, to play really well on Saturday. Next question will come from Len Clark. Marcus, could you give us some insight into your coaches and you preparing for Cal uh, the last 48 hours before kickoff? You know, I think the game plans are are in, and, and now it's about really making sure that, you know, we know exactly – what we want to get done and our players know exactly what we're looking for. And so uh, we just had a meeting and, and as I told those guys, it's it's about us as coaches, making sure our players know exactly what we want, why we want it and, and have the ability to go out there and execute it. Um, and so if, if there's any gray area from now until Saturday, throw it out, you know, condense the packages. But um, it, this is going to be about making sure that we give our players the best opportunity to go out there and have success with the ability to go out and execute because they know exactly what they're doing um, and what we expect from them. Just a reminder, everyone, if you have a question, please use the raised hand function. Uh, Tim O'Malley, you have the next question. Coach, Cal's defensive front is um, it's unique, but it's not something you see all the time. What are the what are the main challenges going against that with the two big guys inside and, and four backers overhanging? Yeah, I think they give you a couple of different looks. They'll play three down, but they'll also get into some four down. And and the big nose guard 91, man, he is a, a house. He is going to be hard to move. And, uh, you know, they're an aggressive unit. Um, you know, obviously the linebacker being the, the defensive coordinator son, you know, he knows exactly what is, you know, is expected. And, and I'm sure he's a quarterback of that defense. And so they're going to present a, a, a great challenge for our offense. And um, I, again, I think the week of preparation has been good. Now, we still have 48 hours to continue to prepare. Um, but, you know, we know we have a, uh, a very a tough challenge ahead of us with a, a really good defensive unit. Next question will come from Tim Priester. Coach, uh, obviously, when you were hired, we saw the reaction of your team, how happy they were that you were the head coach and they loved playing for you. I just wonder if if you have sensed with regard to that, any feeling among the players like the weight of the world is on their shoulders to to succeed. I mean, for Notre Dame, but for, for you as well. No, I think that the focus from myself to our team has been we have to look at why we haven't been successful the first two games and really study it and, and put into action and practice the things we've learned that it's going to take to make sure that we um, have success on Saturdays. And so that's the pressure that I, as the head coach and us, as our coaching staff is putting on our players is here's what we have to do to have success. Here's what we can't do if we want to have success. And now let's make sure in practice that we execute exactly what we're looking for to a T. And so, um, as I told them, you know, you if you continue to listen to all the voices out there that have opinions about um, what you're doing or what we're doing as a football program, you will feel the weight of the world. Focus on the things that that matter to dictate the outcome on Saturday. That's what I want the pressure to be on. Okay, what things truly dictate um, the outcome of a game? And if we continue to focus on those things. Um, we don't have to worry about added pressure from outside and don't, don't play for coach Freeman. We, we're going to play to make sure that we have a chance to have success. And so that's what the, 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 really the, the focus and the message has been is to really let's, let's be critical of our actions in the game and then really take those actions and say, okay, how do we apply that to the way we practice and to ensure that in the game, there is no miscommunication. There is no missed assignments. There is no missed execution, um, you know, and that's what, what we've really been focusing on this week. Next question will come from Len Clark. Oh, I didn't have a question. I'm sorry. Next one will be Eric Hansen. Hi, hey, Marcus. Um, last year, about this time, you recalibrated the defense and it was quite a dramatic change. And I'm, I'm curious, I would imagine that that's more common around college football than maybe we think. But what is it about training camp that you 
that teams and coaches maybe don't recognize those things, then they kind of get exposed in the season. Is it the familiarity with both plays and personnel that that keeps those hidden until the season starts? No, I think maybe it's it's going against a different opponent. Um, you know, when you practice 20 something days against the same opponent, you, you slowly start to figure each other out and what things are are good and what things are not. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden you face an opponent and you look and say, OK, there was a lack of execution at on this play at this position. And and that's what to me um you know, what you have to see as you go throughout the season is you really got to take a deep dive and a, a really honest and realistic look at what are the issues. And um, if we could have foreseen some of the issues that we've had the first two games in, in camp, we would have corrected them. But that's to me what what you have to be able to do no matter if you win or lose. And that's the biggest message I've been sending to um, our players and our coaches is that we can't let the outcome dictate the critical eye we must have as we evaluate um, the games and in practice. You know, sometimes we let the result of a play or the result of a game kind of um, mask the reality of what's going on in terms of by play by play or by position by position. You know, you can have a really good play, but there's somebody on on the field that's not doing their job. And so do we really take a critical eye, no matter if it's a good play or bad play, at every position? And so that's what I've been really trying to focus on is that hold on let's make sure we look at every position on every play and are we executing our assignment or not okay if there's confusion what do we have to do to correct that that could be coaching it better that could be taking the play out that can be changing something within the scheme and so that is to me what I've been doing and what we've been doing is really trying to focus on practice and the past two games with a really critical eye, not looking at the outcome, not looking at it was the play a success or not, but really looking at, you know, each player on the field at that time. And was he getting his job done or was he not? And not overlooking it. That if we need to stop practice, stop practice to correct mistakes. If we need to take something out of the, the scheme, take, take it out. But let's give our guys a chance to truly have success because they know exactly what they're doing on every single play. And then, you know what, on Saturday, you can go play and know that, hey, the things we're going to call offensively and defensively, our players know exactly what they have to do. Now we got to go out and execute it. Next question comes from Mike Berardino. I wondered about the uh, fourth quarter GPS numbers that you I know you analyze every aspect of that practice and otherwise has that been instructive at all individually anything stand out going even looking back at late last year well and I think Mike this is what I've kind of I think if you looked at the Oklahoma State game you looked at Ohio State game even if you looked at the Marshall game you could kind of get distracted by the fourth quarter and say okay we didn't finish and that's what I I think I did after the Oklahoma State game and the Ohio State game say okay what do we have to do to finish and then after the Marshall game, I said, OK, we need to look at the entirety of the game and just look at every single play because there's plays in the first quarter that could have truly dictated the outcome of the game. And so the numbers, GPS numbers don't tell us a great story in terms of the why we didn't win the game, you know, but to me, it's it's more so throughout the entirety of the game. Where are the plays that we're not executing that really can dictate the outcome? It's not just the fourth quarter. It's there's plays throughout the entirety entirety of the game that we have to make sure we correct. Final question this afternoon will come from Patrick Engel. Marcus, going off of like recalibrating and not looking at results as much, how much when you've kind of approached that this week have you found it to be kind of similar to or leaning back to some of the things you might have recalibrated before, like the defense after two games last year or after that first year at Cincinnati and how similar you found that that approach this week is to what you did then? I think there's a lot of similarities to it. Um, you know, it's kind to be, it's be emotionless about it. Like don't take the emotions out, take the outcome out of the game out and really take a, a really critical eye to what's going on. And that's something that I knew we had to do after the season at Cincinnati when we finished 96 in the country defensively. I knew that was something um, that we did last year defensively. I remember I just told the group that was the first two games. I think we had given up close to 70 points. And, you know, 
the the feeling was we were two and oh and it's okay but i know as a defensive staff it wasn't and that we were struggling and, and to really say okay let's stop let's really really dissect everything we're doing let's see what we're doing well okay let's enhance it the things we're not doing well let's either change it let's throw it out or or come up with a new way to do it and so that's to me um the formula is very similar Patrick, is that we have to Again, not focus on outcome, but really take a critical look at everything we're doing. Look at the mistakes and figure out why. We can't, I told us that we cannot continue to say if. If Johnny would have done this, we would have been successful in that play. We got to say why he did or didn't do it and what we have to do to make sure he does do it. That'll wrap up today's press conference. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Coach Freeman. Thanks, guys. It's time now to wrap up this week's edition of Inside Notre Dame Football presented by TireAct.com. Coach, tough news this week. Tyler Buckner, unfortunately, now out for the year with an injury. So Drew Pine steps in as your starter, was your backup. What do you expect from him as he gets this start getting ready for Cal? Yeah, I don't expect anything different out of who Drew Pine is and his preparation. He's always prepared like a starter. And that's the one thing with Drew is that um, he didn't take the news of him not being named a starter great like any competitor would. He understood that, you know, he can lead this football team. And at some point during this season, as I told him in our in my office, at some point, man, he's going to be called upon to lead this team. And who knew it would be after week two, but it's here. And so I had the utmost confidence in him because he doesn't have to change the way he prepares. He always prepared like he's a starter, and uh, I'm excited for him with this opportunity. Another good challenge this week. You've got a Cal team coming to town. As you've gotten ready to prepare for them, what are the biggest challenges they pose to your team? Yeah, the 2-0 Cal team that, that is, is talented. Obviously, the quarterback, we saw him last year um, when he was at Purdue, and, and he's a very precise thrower, uh, makes good decision. We're going to be one of the most talented quarterbacks we, we face. And so it, it's going to be a huge challenge for our defense to make sure we're mixing up looks and we're, we're getting pressure on that quarterback to make him uncomfortable. And that's the one thing going back to looking at last year is that when he was uncomfortable because of the pressure we got on him, we had more success defensively. And, and offensively, you know, we're going to have to uh, really, you know, face a team that's that's a very aggressive, um, that, that does some um, some some different looks in terms of three downs and four down, um, different coverage looks. They got a talented safety and they have a huge nose guard that um, is very stout in the middle. And so th that's going to be us preparing for, for our opponent. But I think the mindset of this team this week has to be it's about us and it's about our preparation and our execution. Because if we do that, if we execute the way we're supposed to and do the things we're supposed to do as Notre Dame football team, um, I have a strong conviction we'll have success. Coach, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. You're listening to The Marcus Freeman Show, presented by the experts at TireRack.com.